I'm Laura. I'm one of the outreach coordinators with XRNYC. Um, been involved in the movement since 2019. I'm going to be introducing Jesse Matheson, who's one of the science rebels. Um, she's going to be your moderator today. Hi, Jesse. I'm going to let you take it away. Laura. Hi, everybody. Um, our speaker today is Professor Andrew Hoffman, who is, you know, and I should have asked how you pronounce this, who's the wholesome, wholesome? Right. Yep. Professor of Sustainable Enterprise at the University of Michigan's Ross School of Business and the School for Environment and Sustainability. He's the author of a number of books. I think uh, the one that is possibly the most relevant to us is um, How Culture Shapes the Climate Change Debate. The talk today is going to be about um, what's going on. So the climate change debate, we all know, it's fiercely polarized and it's become very political and people have lots of feelings about it that are very divergent from each other. Um, and this is true despite the fact that within the scientific community, there's general agreement that, you know, climate change is happening, it's caused by humans. And not only that, in the scientific community, there's a lot of agreement about um, the details of what's happening and why. And it looks like somebody is in the waiting room and needs to be admitted. Um, <clears throat> so what, what's going on with that? Like, why do we have general scientific agreement, but not agreement in our society at large? Um, Dr. Hoffman's gonna be talking a little bit about how the climate change debate, it's moved away in some ways from concrete topics like carbon dioxide, and it's become more about contrasting worldviews. So he's gonna look at this through a variety of different evidence-based lenses, sociology, psychology, um, and so on. And the part that I'm really most looking forward to is he's got some ideas some lessons for how we might constructively engage in a in debate with people who might not agree and how we can move the public conversation forward. And so <clears throat> something I always find interesting, and in case you're wondering, I was a science teacher for a long time. In case you're wondering, I always like to ask people to think to themselves, how would you answer that question? How do you think we could constructively engage people in debate with very different worldviews? Think about that and see if Dr. Hoffman gives you some new ideas. So I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Hoffman. Thank you so much for being here and for giving this talk. Okay, it's um, <clears throat> my pleasure. Well, um, thank you, Jesse, and, and thank you all for inviting me. Um, I do wanna talk about the idea of climate change as a cultural issue, not um, strictly as a scientific issue. I wanna try and give you some tips on how to communicate to people who are in a different tribe from you, a different culture from you. And I also wanna give some thought to what I see happening in the debate and why. Because there is a nice trend going on right now of increasing belief on climate change and there are some really good reasons why. And uh, I think Extinction Rebellion and others in this, what's called the radical flank, have a role to play in pushing this debate forward. Uh, around 2013, I was invited by the development department at the University of Michigan to meet with a potential, potential donor. Uh, the University of Michigan is very good at raising money and they're always luring in donors. And if the donor's interested in a particular topic, they'll try and get a professor to talk to them and maybe they'll give some money. So this donor said he was interested in business and sustainability, which is what I do. And so I agreed to meet with him. And the only time I had free was at seven o'clock in the morning, it was very early. So I showed up in this conference room, still cradling my cup of coffee, still trying to wake up. And there's the development officer on the right side of the table. There's the potential donor across from the table. And before I sat down, the, develop, the, the potential donor said, I think the scientific review process is corrupt. Those were his opening words. So that kind of woke me up. And I said, really? And what do you think of a university based on that system? And he says, I think that, uni that university is corrupt as well. He went on to say that he thought climate change was a hoax. Um, we started to talk about sunspots and solar flares for a little while. And, and then he turned his sights on me and he said, why do you hate capitalism and why do you want to destroy the market by teaching environmental issues in a business school? And so we knocked that around for a little while. And then at one point he said, now, do you know why Earth Day is on the day it's on? And I was getting pretty punchy by that. I said, why don't you tell me why is Earth Day on the day it's on? He said, because that's Karl Marx's birthday. 
I've heard that before. I just turned to the development officer and I said, what's our agenda here this morning? And the donor stepped in and said, I wanna buy you a ticket to the Heartland Conference. Now I did a quick scan of my calendar in my head and found a conflict conveniently and declined and the meeting ended. And I went through the day just stewing over this meeting. I was really angry about this. I was talking to colleagues about it and just couldn't stop thinking about it. And yet the more I thought about it and the more I talked with my colleagues, the more I became fascinated because everything he said hung together. Everything he said represented a consistent worldview. It wasn't a worldview I shared, but it was a consistent worldview nonetheless that allowed him to look at the same science I look at and see something completely different. And this started to fascinate me because I study cultures and institutions, how they evolve, how they change, how they create inertia. And I thought, I'd really like to understand this because I'd, be, I'd become very frustrated by the polarizing elements of the climate change debate and I wanted to understand it more. And so I started doing research, writing papers, um, wrote this book and did what academics do, write a stream of research. I wanna give you the summation of that research right now. And that is this, that for many people in this country, the debate over climate change is not about CO2. It's not about climate models. It's not even about science. It's about conflicting worldviews and them defending values that they hold dear, that they feel are threatened by an acceptance of climate change. This is a very important insight because if you do what most of us do when faced with someone who doesn't believe in climate change, you start to give them a science lecture. But that's not the form of their resistance. They've already seen the science and they've rejected it for other reasons. So they start to get annoyed. And what do you do? You find another science lesson, you find another PowerPoint deck, you pound it even harder, and they start digging their heels in. And that's what we do that gets the mistake. It needs to understand what is the subtext in the debate in order to try and get through. So there's the gist of what I want you to take away from this. I wanna try and give it a little more meat. As I said, I'll end with a story to try and drive it home and then we'll, we, can, we can discuss this. I wanna begin, we're gonna look at climate change, but there are numerous issues in this country right now where there are wide gaps between the scientific community and the general public. Uh, climate change, and this data is from 2014, it's narrowing, I'll get to that at the end, but climate change, 37 point gap. Is it safe to eat genetically modified foods, 51 point gap. Now I wanna call these two out and I leave this slide, even though it's slightly dated for a very deliberate reason. What I'm gonna to get to shortly is some of the partisan divide on this issue. And the reasons for the partisan divide get down to worldviews. And they get us to bias against certain science if it conflicts with our worldviews. When it comes to climate change, it's predominantly conservatives and Republicans who reject the science. When it comes to GMOs, it's, it, it comes down predominantly to Democrats and liberals who reject the science. This is, and what I'm gonna talk about here is equal opportunity. We all do it. We could also be talking about COVID right now and what's happening in the COVID debate, how, how messy and, and, and politically laden it has become because it has cultural inflections, political inflections that we need to understand. So the idea of climate change as a cultural issue is important because you start with a scientific consensus and we do have one, we've had one for quite a while. But in my view, scientists expected the consensus to form and people just to fall in line and accept it. And that was extremely naive. It was a, there's been a joke for a while that when scientists came forward and said climate change was real, they were surprised by the mobilization from the fossil fuel sector in particular in opposition. They were surprised. And so they went to battle, but it was kind of like the Boy Scouts going against the Marines. They were totally outgunned. They were totally unprepared. Because it takes time to develop a social consensus. It takes time for people to understand what the sciences are saying, not just in terms of the science, but in terms of what it means for their life and why they should do something about it. There's a very sharp distance between getting someone to understand an issue and be made motivated to do something about it. That comes down to culture, that comes down to, to, to values. Think about, for example, cigarettes and human health. For decades, scientists said cigarettes cause cancer. And for decades, the American public rejected that conclusion. Um, why did they do that? Well, because they were, fed a diet of information, they distrusted the science, they preferred to trust uh, Madison Avenue, and they were actually told that cigarettes were good for you. Here's ads from the 50s and 60s, 
Your doctor recommends you smoke camels. Your dentist recommends you smoke viceroys. All down the line, people were told that cigarettes were good for you. But over time, a social consensus formed, a social consensus that says that cigarettes are bad for you. How do you know you have a social consensus? Because you're not afraid to talk about it with people you don't know, because you know that we all share the same worldview. I would imagine that you would not be afraid to say to someone you don't know, say to someone you don't know cigarettes cause cancer, that's bad for you. Um, that's how you know you have a social consensus. How do you know you don't have a social consensus on climate change? People don't talk about it. Here's some data that Yale has put together. And do you talk about climate change with family or friends? Look at that number, about 62%, rarely or never, because I'm sure you've been there. The topic comes up at a dinner table and you know if you go down this path, it's gonna turn really ugly and it's gonna destroy the evening. So you change the subject. Perhaps you've done this, perhaps you haven't. But this tells me that people are still afraid to bring up climate change in polite company. And you'll know that we have a social consensus when that black line starts to rise significantly higher from what it is. Now to understand it as a cultural issue, it helps to look and see how we understand the cultural boundaries on the different views. On environmental issues, the demographic variables are typically these. Those who care about the environment are usually more women than men. It's younger more than older. It's the coasts more than the middle. It's urban more than rural. It's educated more than less so. It's affluent more than less so. It's Democrat more than Republican. On climate change, most of those variables go away. And the number one correlate with someone's belief on climate change is their political party affiliation. In fact, this, this work right here by Riley Dunlap and Aaron McCright is some really nice work tracking between 2001 and 2010. And I will bring these graphs up to date because there's a kink around 2010 where it starts to turn back up. But what's fascinating there is over that decade, Republicans and conservatives believed in climate change less Democrats and liberals believed in it more. That to me is a smoking gun, that there's a cultural dimension to these issues. Are these people taught about science in a different way? No. Do they have a worldview and a lens through which they view the science that skews their view of it? Yes. And there it is. And so we need to start to dissect that. You may be curious to know also that if you go to the left on those graphs, that those lines merge around 1997. And I'm sure you're aware 1997 is a very important date in the climate change debate because that's the year of the Kyoto Treaty. And with the Kyoto Treaty, what was previously a scientific issue became an economic issue. It became an issue that threatened powerful economic and political interests. And, the, and then the split starts to begin and the, and the debate starts to change. And so that's what we need to look at is what is causing that divide? What is causing that schism? So. What I want to offer you, first of all, to try and understand it, is four points from social psychology. I'm going to briefly go over these, make this as painless as possible, but they apply to all of us. The first is we all use cognitive filters. We all have motivated reasoning. We will readily accept something if it confirms our worldview. We'll challenge it or reject it if it challenges our worldview. We all do this on simple things. We do it on complicated things. I'm driving down the road. I hear a, a rattle in the front right corner of my car. What does my brain start to think? Well, it must be a loose note, a bolt, or maybe a stone. I'm looking for something minor because I'm motivated to reach a conclusion that I don't have to go to the mechanic. Jonathan Haidt, the psychologist at NYU, has done some wonderful work on this. And he describes it this way. When you're faced with a complex issue, your emotions kick in really fast for a number of reasons, which I'll get into, and you reach a conclusion very, very quickly. Um, your reason comes in a distant second, and your reason is looking for information to confirm the decision that your emotions came to so quickly. So he says, we don't act like scientists. We act like lawyers when we're trying to make decisions like this. We are motivated. We are acting on motivated reasoning. Number two, where do these cognitive filters come from? Well, they come from our cultural identity, what Dan Kahana Yale calls cultural cognition. You want to fit with the groups of which you're a part, whether that's people at work, people in your community, your church, uh, your bowling league, wherever you associate, it's painful to stand out. And we typically try to conform to some extent with the worldviews of the communities of which we're a part. 
Um, this is tremendously important to this debate because there's so many forces right now that are pushing us into tribes, into separate communities. So for example, on social media, uh, how many of you have unfriended somebody on Facebook because they post things that you find objectionable? You are creating a filter bubble. You are creating a, a world around you of people that think like you do. Twitter, in my opinion, is one rage machine. It is filtered based on the networks I've created, the search patterns I've used, and it feeds me stuff that designed to outrage me. Our filter bubbles are created by the social media platforms we have. Further, um, who do you consider to be a spokesperson of your tribe? I could offer two names right now. I think I know this audience. I can tell you which one you would pick, but one of them you will say, I won't believe a word that person says. The other one you say, I will believe what they say. Sean Hannity, Al Gore. I could do that in any audience. And I can, depending on the audience, they'll pick one or the other. They will totally treat the other as anathema. Um, what news sources do you consider representative of your tribe's views? There is research to show that this is true. Um, Fox News, we will believe less in climate change. NPR, you'll believe in more in climate change. You get a diet of information that feeds your worldview and supports it. And so social media, um, uh, pundits, um, cable news, these are all dividing us as a public into tribes around our political identity, our partisan identity, and climate change maps really neatly onto this. And therefore it has become an issue that has been inverted. Where it used to be you picked your political identity and then, I'm sorry, you picked your, your issues and how you, you, you cared about them. And then you would pick a political identity that most closely aligned, but didn't have to be perfect. And now we have people that pick an identity and then the issues just fall in place. If you're a conservative, you must believe these things. If you're a liberal, you must believe, believe these things. And that further reinforces the divides in our culture. Cultural identity can overpower scientific reasoning. We are what's called cognitive misers. We have a limited amount of cognitive ability and we spend it very frugally. Uh, and we don't like it when we have to spend it. So for example, uh, I, remember, I remember the first time I went to a, an organic food store. I went to the, uh, the, the cereal aisle and I was faced with a wall of cereals I'd never seen before. And I had to spend cognitive energy trying to figure out what to buy. What used to be an automatic decision, walk in, grab my Cheerios, walk out. Now it took some time and it really annoyed me because this is just one thing I had to buy in the store and this is gonna make for a very long grocery trip. I didn't like having to spend that cognitive energy. Max Weber, a sociologist from the early 1900s, last century, had a really wonderful idea. I like this. He says, we get through our day by activating black boxes. What he meant by that is, I get in my car, I turn it on. I don't need to know how the car works for it to get me to where I'm gonna go. I don't open that black box. I go to the airport. I don't need to know how TSA works. I don't need to know how, how uh, uh, border control works. I don't need to know how jet engine works. It gets me where I need to go. I don't open that black box. Some black boxes we choose not to open. Um, I, uh, a number of years ago, I had to have an artificial hip put in. I started looking at some videos. I started turning green. My wife said, Andy, you really better turn those off and put your trust in the doctors. And that's what I did. I closed the black box. We have to do this to get through our day. If you had to open every black box in which you encountered today, you would have had a trouble getting through the day. If you had to know everything about the food that got on your plate, everything about the food, the clothes that you're wearing, everything about the energy to run this computer in front of you, it would be very hard to get through your day. We'd become cultural, uh, psychological cripples. And so we have to do this. And that leads us to shortcuts. So do you believe in climate change? Well, how many of us have read all the IPCC reports? I suspect very few of us. But we might say, you know what? My pastor seems really smart on science. I'm gonna ask her. Or, you know, that guy in my golf league, he seems to really keep up on the science. He speaks really authoritatively. I'm gonna go with him. Or my boss says this is really important, so I'm gonna go with her. And we turn it over to people that we trust and respect rather than the experts that are out there to eliminate the expenditure of cognitive energy. This is what we all do. We do it in simple ways, we do it in complicated ways.
The fourth and final point, and you can't leave it out of this, our political and social economy creates resistance and inertia for change. The idea that we are gonna uh, uh, announce that climate change is real and expect the fossil fuel industry to embrace it and start scheduling their demise is naive. They would fight to maintain what they have and that's what they've done. And they needed to be fought against to get movement going. So we have to bring that into this conversation. But I wanna highlight some things that are really troubling and important here. On the right, the National Geographic, the war on science. Uh, this is very disconcerting, the extent to which people are turning away from science, seeing it as just another political interest. Look what's happened with COVID, the treatment of Dr. Fauci. This is very disconcerting. And scientists are really trying to figure out what to do about this. I'm on a committee with the National Academies of Science called, unfortunately called the Sackler Colloquium on the Science of Science Communication. I can't take the name off because they gave the money, but it's how do we communicate science? A lot of people are trying to figure this out, especially in a time of misinformation and disinformation. And so you get Jenny McCarthy, Robert Kennedy Jr. saying vaccines are dangerous. Um, I wanna to point to the two boxes to the right of Jenny McCarthy. The first one is a book, and I put that in huge quotation marks, Why Scientists Disagree About Global Warming. If you look closely, that book, and again, put that in very sarcastic quotes, is not by the IPCC, it's by the NIPCC, the Non-Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's actually by the Heartland Institute, the conference I was invited to by my potential donor, which is the number one climate skeptics conference in the country. They produced this book to cast doubt on the science of climate change. And the important point is they printed up thousands of copies of this and sent it to, to K through 12 science teachers around the country to try and change the K through 12 science education. That gives you a sense of the war that's underway on this issue. And then the one next to it, there is a serious problem we in academia are trying to wrestle with and, and, and it, it's really disconcerting. There are a lot of pseudoscientific journals out there. They look real, they are not. I, there are journals out there that if I pay a, a chunk of money, I can get published, bang, done. No, no review, published. I've been invited to be an editor chief of a medical journal, of an engineering journal, even though I'm a business professor, no qualifications because they're pseudoscientific, they're fake. And some scientists wanted to really call it out that these are there. And so they published a paper, you can look this up. It's called, get me off your fucking mailing list. And it's that sentence over and over again. They even have charts in there, take, arrow, me, arrow, off your effing mailing list. Now, obviously that's a joke, but there are other papers that come out of these journals that are not obviously a joke and it's confusing the public. And so this is what's at stake. These are the elements that hopefully will get you to see what's going on in the debate and maybe understand a little more about the, the complexities of it beyond the science and how we can go forward. At the end of the day, the point I wanna take here is that once our minds are made up and our position aligns with our cultural identity, Providing additional scientific data can make us more resolute and resistant conclusions that are at variance with our cultural beliefs. So you meet someone that doesn't believe in climate change and you whip out a PowerPoint deck, you're actually working against yourself. You're gonna find that the, the, the conversation is gonna spiral because they're getting more and more resistant to what you're trying to offer because they've already seen the data. They already have a lens through which they see the very same data and they reject it because they don't trust it. The challenge in communication is overcoming distrust. So what I want to do is offer you four forms of distrust, ways to overcome them. Very, I see I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little behind on time. Go really quickly what I see happening in the debate, and then we'll open up the conversation. What's the first form of distrust? Well, they distrust the messengers. And the messenger is as important as the message. If I said something, and Joe Biden said something, the exact same thing, and Donald Trump said the exact same thing, you'd hear something very different from the three of us, even though we use the exact same words, the messenger is as important as the message. And there are many people out there that don't trust environmentalists, democratic politicians, and or scientists. Some people don't trust all three. Environmentalists, um, people on the far right in the climate skeptic movement refer to environmentalists as watermelons. They're re red, green on the outside, they're red on the inside. They're communist borderline socialists. They wanna use the state as a means to control your lives and limit your freedom. That's the way they see them. So anything that environmentalist says, they're not gonna believe it. 
they don't believe in Democrat, don't believe Democratic politicians, that's not hard to understand. And a lot of them don't believe scientists. And this is quite fascinating. It's not new. The book that won the Pulitzer Prize in 1964, Anti-Intellectualism in American Life, wrote about this. Hofstadter wrote about this, that people look at scientists, they live in this ivory tower, they study things they don't understand, they use a language they can't comprehend, they have a disproportionate influence on the political process, they don't trust them. And so when scientists say something, they're distrustful. And a lot of people in the climate uh, skeptic movement are still sore because they also happen, some of them overlap with the intelligent design and evolution debate. And they don't appreciate the way scientists treated them there. So they don't like the way they treat them here. How do we overcome this distrust? We find climate brokers. You find people that they trust. If you're talking to somebody and you think that they are respectful of the military, bring up the military. They're very concerned about climate change. Business, very concerned about climate change. Bring in a spokesperson that they trust. I want evangelicals to be hearing it from evangelicals. I want business people to hear it from business people. Find people they trust, those you're talking to. And in my opinion, the most important brokers we need are from the market and from the political right. Bring those in and they are coming forward. There's a lot of movement in the Republican Party to acknowledge this is real. They've moved on to other kinds of tactics, but the idea of arguing that it's real is becoming increasingly untenable. Second, they distrust the process that created the message. And as my potential donor said, he thought the scientific review process is corrupt. That the logic is that I will only get funded if I satisfy the political interests of funders. I will only get published if I satisfy the political interests of editors. And so they don't trust scientists and they don't trust the United Nations and they certainly don't trust the IPCC. And they look at that as a threat of our sovereignty. Who are these developing countries to tell us what to do through this thing called the United Nations? I don't trust them. How do we do to get over that? Well, there's a strong correlation, and this has been shown in social science research between belief in the scientific consensus and a belief in climate change. I fall back on this when I'm, when I'm faced with someone who doesn't believe in climate change. There are over 400 scientific agencies around the world that agree with the IPCC consensus statement on climate change, including every one of the G8 plus five countries. I know this by heart because I will say this to somebody. I say, what do you know that these scientists don't know? And that is hard for them. Uh, they will find some ways, but I keep falling back on that. I don't wanna go down a rabbit hole of their particular pet theory because I focus on that. And then I separate the problem from, well, I don't believe in climate change is real because I don't want a carbon tax to ruin the economy. Separate issue. You can say climate change is real, but I think it's gonna damage the economy. That would be an honest discussion. And so focus on the process, focus on the idea that the scientists are out there and they are showing us things that I take for granted because I trust science. I believe there's something called an atom. I believe that there's electrons flying around this nucleus, that this body's made up of billions of these. I will never see one in my life, but I believe it's true because I trust science. And you know what? You trust science when you go to the hospital or help your son or daughter with a chemistry or biology homework. Science is really a major part of our society. So why do you reject it on this one? <clears throat> the third form of distrust, they distrust the message itself. This one I find extremely provocative for really driving the point that if this is what they're hearing, what I have on the screen here, and you give them scientific data, you're talking right past them. For some people, belief in climate change is a threat to their belief in God. The idea that humans have become so powerful that they can alter the global climate for some people is pure hubris. We are not in charge out there. God is in charge out there. We live by divine providence. I got heckled at a talk one time from someone holding a Bible saying, climate change cannot be happening because God promised Noah he would never flood the earth again. Think about that for a second. If that's what you're up against, you've got a lot of work to try to get through to this person. You really need to find a way to reach this person and not with scientific data. You've got to find another way in. And then a lot of people have discomfort with climate scenarios. This is a very interesting point here. And I'm going to get to it later because there's some disagreement on this. But... For the most part, the belief that if you give people the doomsday scenario, they will shut down, they will turn off. They typically believe the world is a nice place, and so they choose not to listen. Uh, how many of you have seen the movie The Day After Tomorrow? Uh, probably one of the worst movies for communicating climate change, the idea of Madison Avenue underwater with, uh, or Manhattan underwater with, with glaciers moving down Madison Avenue. People just shut down, they don't go with it. Now, how to overcome the message issue? We find a broker frame, and this is tremendously powerful. 
um, you can frame this issue as risk management. Um, I have, for example, fire insurance on my house. The odds of it burning down are low. The consequences are high. Low consequence or low probability, high consequence event, you get insurance. Climate change is a low probability, high consequence event. Insurance is investment in behavior and technology change. You can frame it as a health issue. Now you've made it personal. In a health crisis, our vulnerable get sick, some die, as has happened in urban centers. They called you grandparents and your grandchildren. You can frame this as a national security issue. Thomas Friedman has been trying to do this. You can frame this as a military issue. There's a group called the CNA group, a group of retired army generals that call climate change a threat multiplier. And if we don't deal with this issue, we're going to have more and more climate refugees, and we're going to have to deal with it through our military. Is that what you want? Jane Lubchenco had a really nice example. When she was head of NOAA, she had a scientist come to her, a, a, a conservative Republican congressman come to him, and there'd just been a hurricane. And he said, Jane, can you blame that on climate change? And she said, look at it this way. And she knew this guy was really into baseball. She said, if you got a baseball player and he takes steroids and he hits a home run, can you blame that baseball, that home run on steroids? Oh, of course not. But if that baseball player's home run average and batting average for the entire season went up that year after taking steroids, would you blame that on steroids? He says, yeah, probably. So think of climate change as weather on steroids. That's the way to approach it. And so I just like this idea of broker frames. Find a language that works for your audience. When I'm speaking to business audiences, I talk about consumer demand, operational efficiency, cost of capital. Climate change affects every one of those. I put it in the language of business. And then avoid cataclysmic scenarios. People generally shut down. There's a nice book by David King uh, on climate change. What I like about it is the two appendices in the back. One says, this is what climate skeptics say, and this is why they're wrong. The other says, this is what climate alarmists say and this is why they're wrong. And he calls it climate porn. It's extreme, it's meant to excite, it's titillating, it's false. And so avoid those. The fourth form of distrust is they distrust the solutions. You can advocate for a carbon price. Um, you're advocating for a large government program, very intrusive government program. And if you haven't noticed, the size of government is a big debate in this country right now. And you might say, and we need one on the global level. Well, who's going to do that? Maybe the United Nations. You just stepped on a landmark. People are so afraid of a one world government. So how do you get over this? Well, you move beyond the negative, first of all. Frame it in the positive. Schellenberger and Nordhaus, are a really nice essay a number of years ago called The Death of Environmentalists. And they brought this up that environmentalists, they always focus on the negative. And the negative doesn't motivate. It scares. And he talks about, they, they have a really nice way of making this point. He says, one of, what's one of the most inspirational speeches of all time? It's called, I have a dream. It wasn't called, I have a nightmare. And that really is important for understanding why people are motivated to strive for something as you frame it in the positive. Can you envision a better world where we address climate change? I think you can, because I can. Frame it around American ingenuity. Frame it around competitiveness. I'm amazed when people try and make the argument that people who believe in climate change have no faith in American ingenuity. And my answer is we have complete faith in American ingenuity and to, to really deal with this, to get this done. So those are the things on the table. Whip out your PowerPoint deck on science, good luck. But if you can try and understand or reach people through these different lenses, then you're gonna have a much better way of getting through the conversation and hopefully reach these people. So I would encourage you to think about doing this. Now, I, I did say I want to talk about what's happening in the debate because I told you the line kinked around uh, 2010 for belief in climate change. You can see it's been coming up ever since. And we can get into more detail, but you, you probably know that 2009, 2010, that was climate gate. That was sort of the bottom of, or the, the, the pinnacle, you might say, of, of climate skepticism. And it's been coming up ever since. One thing I find quite fascinating here, more people believe that it's happening than believe there's a scientific consensus that it's happening. I'll leave that to you for you to puzzle over. But there is a turn, and we're going in the right direction. In this last election, this blows my mind. The idea that environmental protection and climate change could rival jobs and economic growth in the presidential debate is a top priority. People are becoming concerned about this issue. The Yale Center on Climate Communication does a, what's called the Six Americas Study. They do it every year. They break people into six different categories with alarmed and concerned on the far left, and those are the highest belief in climate change, and the doubtful and dismissive on the right, those least concerned about climate change. And you can see 
The left is growing, the right is shrinking. The, the, the momentum is moving towards being alarmed and concerned about climate change between 2013 and 2018. In fact, on many dimensions, those numbers have been going up. It's going, I think it's happening up 11%. I'm worried about a 16%. It will harm me personally up 11%. This is tremendously important because typically people have been ignore, able to ignore climate change because it's going to happen to somebody else, someplace else in the future. And if you can show people it's happened to people I know or even me, now it changes the conversation. And this summer, with the wildfires, with the hurricanes, uh, the conversation is shifting. It's changing people beliefs as we speak because ex exposure to radical weather changes beliefs, people's beliefs on this. Even the partisan divide is starting to narrow. You can see that most registered voters think the global warming is happening. 98% of liberal Democrats, 69% uh, of liberal to moderate Republicans. And it goes down the list. And this is important too, because if you get Demo uh, Republican politicians and particularly the staffers behind closed doors, they'll typically tell you, I know climate change is real. I know the science is there, but I, I'll lose my constituency if I, if, I, if I shift on this. And they look at Bob Inglis as the poster child of that and they don't wanna do it. That calculus is rapidly becoming obsolete, outdated, certainly in certain constituencies. Um, I suspect that the Republican base would breathe a sigh of relief, finally. They're gonna recognize the science that we all know is true. This is only gonna get more and more extreme. Why are people changing their views? So here's a study um, from uh, University of Chicago. Recent extreme weather events, number one. That is getting people to shift their views. And then arguments supporting the existence of climate change and personal observations of weather in your area. This attached a connection to real life. Think about COVID. And how many people thought it was a hoax until they got sick or someone they knew got sick? Then it becomes real. It makes me sad, it makes me frustrated that people don't trust scientists as much as they should and don't believe it until it touches them personally. Um, that's problematic, but there are other ways that it can touch them personally. And one spokesperson that's starting to emerge on the scene, a spokesperson that we have, a, believe it or not, in our country, a tremendous amount of respect for are meteorologists. And more and more meteorologists are talking about climate change when they're talking about these weather events. Why did that hurricane reach category four? Well, let me explain it to you. The water's getting warmer because of climate change. It builds up more energy as it comes across and it becomes part of their daily diet. And so that started to change the conversation. Another shift in the conversation, again, people are experiencing it firsthand. I don't know if you guys remember this, but back in 2012, North Carolina banned the use of science prediction, scientific predictions of sea level rise in you know, insurance projections, in planning. Uh, there was always a joke, what is sea level rise? And scientists would show this graph and all these lines going up except North Carolina would be flat. And it was a politically imposed decision. Now these very same communities are having to make some very difficult decisions over seawalls. You can't put up seawalls for everybody. Who do you protect? How much money do you wanna spend? They are facing it in real life. They can't ignore it anymore. And it's starting to change the debate. Something I wanna bring up for this group in particular um, is something called the radical flank effect. Excuse me for getting wonky for a second there. And you, you don't need to know that, but there are two camps when you think about the role of the market in dealing with this issue. Um, you look at market as a problem or the solution, look at business as the enemy or the ally, your form of engagement can be confrontation or collaboration. I'm guessing that Extinction Rebellion falls more on the dark green side. I'm in a business school trying to teach about changing, trying to get business to change on this issue, so I'm on the bright green side. Now, an important point here is for me to be right, you don't have to be wrong. For you to be right, I don't have to be wrong because the ecology around this social movement is diverse and people have a role to play. The radical flank effect was developed by the sociologist named Haynes in 1984. He was looking at the civil rights movement. And here's the way he looked at it. You had Martin Luther King and he had a message and it was too extreme for mainstream white America to accept. They, they rejected it until Malcolm X came along and pulled the radical flank way out here. And all of a sudden, Martin Luther King becomes a moderate. The two of them disliked each other intensely, but they also recognized they needed each other to do what they needed to do. They were foils for each other. 
And on climate change, on the environment, the radical flank is tremendously important. So when Naomi Klein says we had to shred capitalism and come up with a new system, that pulls a radical flank out. When Bill McKibben says that the oil industry is public enemy number one and we have to put them out of business, pulls a radical flank out. Bill McKibben, through his rhetoric, through his writing, has introduced topics like stranded assets. Um, and now you can start to see topics like that show up in Business Week, in Forbes. It's entered the business lexicon. And an Extinction Rebellion, Rainforest Action Network, Greenpeace have a tremendously important role in sort of planting the purity flag. Because as you collaborate, you know, things get a little muddy and you always need to keep clear, where are we trying to go here? What are we trying to do? And hold people's feet to the fire. And so you have to decide what role you want to play. I've chosen mine. You choose yours and play it and play it well. The reality is, if you look at the movement, there aren't enough dark greens, if you ask me, because most of the money flows to the bright greens. And so uh, they're needed all the more. So I just want to bring that into this conversation. And we can talk about that some more, because that also brings up, and I told you I'd talk about this. There is a question of whether we should scare the bejesus out of people, whether it is OK to give them the worst case scenario. And if you didn't see it, this was an article in New York Magazine in 2017, Uninhabitable Earth. It opens with this. It is, I promise, worse than you think. If your anxiety about global warming is dominated by fears of sea level rise, you are barely scratching the sur surface of what terrors are possible. And off it goes. And it gave the worst case scenario for climate change. It was the most read story in the magazine's history. If you look it up, read it. But then get the subsequent issue and want, read the letters to the editor. It was a very intelligent, interesting debate. You shouldn't do this. He held his ground and said, yes, I did. I should. People need to know how bad this can get. We need to pull the, he didn't say radical flank, but we need to pull the radical flank way out here. So if you, if you could just talk about sea level rise, that doesn't sound so bad. I'm just going to go swimming a little earlier on the beach than, than, than normal. But he feels that you got to pull the radical flank out and really give people a healthy dose of what, what is out there. And so I leave it to you. That's an open debate. And I've shifted on this that maybe it is important. And maybe people are ready for these more extreme views now that climate change has become more visible. Scientists are now talking about whether they're seeing evidence of the Gulf Stream slowing. Could If it stopped, this would be catastrophic. This really would be a pivot that would be very, very scary. I would add, by the way, that this article got a very sizable book advance. And there is a book out there, uh, Learning to Die in the Anthropocene by David Wallace Wells because of this article. So there is an appetite for it. Um, and its role in the debate can't be debated. Other drivers, I think the youth movement is tre tremendously important. Typically on envir environmental movements, the environmental movement is indeterminate. Who's an environmentalist? I don't know. If we have women's issues, we have women. If we have minor minority issues, we have minorities. We have clear constituencies. It doesn't mean everybody in those groups are part of the social movement, but we can actually identify a group to say they're being wronged, they're aggrieved. But on the environment, who do we have? Young people have come forward and said, we're aggrieved. It's our future. We're doing this to us. I would also add, and I should put a part of this, the environmental justice movement, the Black Lives Matter movement has really morphed the environmental movement to bring environmental justice more to the play. Again, we now have an aggrieved party and that changes the conversation. For me, the most important driver for really shifting the climate change debate, and again, I sit in a business school, so I'm holding a hammer, everything looks like a nail, but this is the lever I'm working. I want this issue to be seen as an economic issue. To my mind, if you wanna make an issue salient, put a dollar sign on it. And so what's happening in this country with insurance right now is putting a dollar sign on it. If you look at the economics of climate change, it's really starting to play out in a very serious way. Every one of these sectors is being impacted by climate change right now. Uh, change in growing patterns, interrupted construction work plans, uh, availability for water for beverages, tourism, all these sectors are being impacted by climate change and are starting to make adjustments. There are two that I think are critically important as canaries in the coal mine to be able to shift the broader market and the first one is insurance. Insurance changes business practice. Insurance changes individual practice. Insurance makes everything go. You can't drive, you can't build a building, you can't do anything without insurance. Insurance is critically important. And if you look at these payouts, look on the bottom left, rising frequency of natural, natural disasters. 
That does not come from an environmental group. That comes from Munich Re. That's a reinsurance company. And I always use this with skeptics because they look at that and they say, it's biased. That's not biased. It's an insurance company. They have no political dog in this fight. They're just looking at the numbers. We'll look at the graph next to it, insured catastrophe losses. Upward trend, but spiky, unpredictable. That's what scares insurance companies the most. If I had a nice linear trend, I can price my instruments. I can amortize my risk. I can write a policy. But if it's up and down, that starts to get scary because you can hit by a black swan and you can be in serious trouble. So look at global insured losses for wildfires, 2010 to 2018, already very high. 2021 is going to blow this right off the map. And you can already see it start to play out. You want to rebuild in California after the wildfires? Good luck. <clears throat> Maybe you can find a policy. It's going to be very expensive. It's going to have less coverage. And some insurance companies are going to require, are requiring that you buy into the private firefighter company because it's a whole lot cheaper to put the fire out than pay for the loss. Um, up in the upper left, the Society of Actuaries does a survey every year. And in 2019, climate change for the first time popped to the top of the list of emergent risks that we're really worried about. And this is very important because typically insurance companies, they write their policies on an annual basis. A lot of them felt, Warren Buffett felt, not to worry about it. If something happens, we'll adjust in the next year policy cycle. And now people are saying, uh, no, the, 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 the extreme events are happening too quickly. Very dangerous posture to have. The finance sector is also critically important. The growth of ESG investing, um, whether it's divestment, whether it's uh, uh, mutual funds or, or, or index funds on ESG incorporation, they're starting to grow. It, especially during COVID, ESG investing has really gone up. People are trying to find good actors. And I even put that down in the bottom left, a report that says from why to why not, sustainable investing is the new normal. I don't know if you can see who wrote that, but again, it's not an environmental group, it's McKinsey Management Consulting. And so that is really becoming part of the economic sector. You can also see some interesting things happen. I love it when the Rockefeller Brothers Fund divests from fossil fuels with a very strong statement of how immoral it is to be involved with fossil fuels, even though all their money came from fossil fuels. The Norwegian Wealth Fund as well. You have a lot of interesting movement in finance starting to shift away from financial risk in the fossil fuel sector. You can also look at how this is gonna impact people differentially. This is a study that was done by the Brookings Institution over what's the impact on, by county by county of climate change by 2080, 2099. And you can see in the South, serious negative impact on the economy. Interestingly, look along the Northern border, there actually can be a boost to GDP, increased growing seasons, um, changing in crops, see how it plays out. But this will again, really start to shift the debate, particularly in countries, because I, they have a corollary chart with this. I didn't put it in here, I should have, where they correlate impact on the economy with whether they voted for Trump or Clinton in, in the last election. And for the most part, the counties and the states that are gonna hit the hardest lean right. And so these weather events are gonna to start to push them harder and harder on their, on their ideological belief that climate change is not real. I think another interesting aspect of this is the shift from carbon reduction to more and more companies talk about carbon neutral. If you'd asked me five, seven years ago, I would have thought carbon neutrality would stay in a conversation among a bunch of, of pointy-headed academics. And now it's really hit the business lexicon and it's become very, very interesting. Also in countries, New Zealand, Costa Rica, Iceland, trying to uh, go carbon neutral. The interesting thing here though, is to go carbon neutral, it's a totally different way of approaching the problem. Uh, you have to think about it very differently. And especially if you're gonna go carbon negative, which some companies are even talking about doing, it's a totally different equation. Going further, and I'm cognizant of the time, I apologize. Um, the markets are shifting. Renewable energy is starting to really take off, wind and solar. Uh, the, the, the markets for vegetable-based um, meats is really starting to take off. If you wanna really make an impact on your carbon footprint, go vegetarian. The movement into electric cars is really moving. Norway is leading the way with uh, more than half of the cars sold being electric. Uh, and in this country, ask, I'm in Detroit, ask anyone in the auto sector, what's the future of the auto sector? The answer is electric, period, end of sentence. And so these, the economies are changing and we can even see it in some established sectors. These numbers just blow me away. The idea that Tesla has a market cap 10 times that of General Motors is just astounding. 
if you had asked me 15 years ago, would anyone even enter the auto market? I would have said, no way. Capital costs are too much. It would be crazy. And Tesla now has them all chasing. When Elon Musk first proposed Tesla, everyone said, you're crazy. Electrics aren't going to catch on. And he did it anyway. Now they're chasing him. The same thing's happening in the energy sector. We look at next year energy, Enel, Iberdrola. These are renewable energy utilities, and their market cap is rivaling ExxonMobil, Shell, BP. And I would also add jobs are rivaling as well. And if you really want to get politicians to pay attention to an issue, talk about money, talk about jobs, and you get a shift in the conversation. Last two slides before I wrap up. I think the conversation has also shifted in a very interesting way that people are starting to question um, uh, capitalism. I'm not saying moving towards socialism, but recognizing it's broken. And it's broken for two reasons. In the environmental side, climate change. On the social side, income inequality. And, and, and capitalism is failing. And so here are statements, and there are many, many more, not from activists, but for people within the market, saying the market is broken and something needs to change. Even to the point where we have BlackRock, Business Roundtable, World Economic Forum, coming out with statements saying that Milton Friedman was wrong. The purpose of the corporation is not make money for the shareholder. It is to provide value to society. Now, I take these with a grain of salt. These are aspirational statements and they have a long way to go to put those into practice, but they've opened the conversation. And this is an important conversation to have because just pure and unadulterated greed is what got us into this mess. Pure and unadulterated greed, the market as it exists, will not get us out of it. The market has to adjust. The energy and the power within the market shifted. Because at the end of the day, if you ask me, if the market doesn't solve this problem, it won't be solved. The market is the most powerful institution on earth. Business is the most powerful entity within it. We need to get businesses to shift, to start to, to, to address these problems, or they won't be solved. I leave you with that. I put my cards on the table, and you can attack me if you wish. We can have a good conversation. And thank you very much for your attention. So thank you so much. I think I speak for everyone here. Uh, I was really interested by that. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, so what we're gonna do now is we have some time for questions, bit of a discussion. Um, so we've got a couple, yes, we have one question in the chat. So I'm gonna share that. And then for anyone else who has a question on your mind, you can either put it into the chat or you can formulate it and then either raise your physical hand or raise your Zoom hand. So the question, this is from Karen, um, as activists, who should be our target with our message? Can we hope to reach people beyond the cultural divide or should we focus on people already sympathetic to the issue? And I'm gonna add on to Karen and say, I, I've been thinking about this a lot myself and I've been, I had assumed that my best purpose was to target people who are sympathetic, but not active. But this conversation has me thinking, well, maybe there's more to it than that. Maybe there's another perspective and another way of thinking about it that might be even more useful. So I'm curious what you have to say about that. I'm gonna, if, to answer that, I'm gonna reshare a slide if I may. Oh, there, okay. Uh, I think this slide speaks to what uh, Karen is asking. Um, you have on the left, the alarm, the concern, on the right, the doubtful, dismissive, and in the middle, you have the cautious and disengaged. And um, uh, if you were to draw a bell curve, you would find that it, 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 it humps in the middle and then you get the loud tails. Um, my general advice is the dismissive and the alarmed are really not open to a conversation. I, I put those two together. They're, they're, they're firm in their beliefs and they're there to win and they will not move. I mean, do we honestly think that you can get James Inhofe to change his position on climate change? I really don't think so. He staked too much of his reputation on it. If he changed his mind, I think it would just, it would, it would end his political career. So if you enjoy bucking heads with people, go for the dismissive. Um, I will do it for the people that are listening. Um, but I don't expect to change a dismissive's mind. But in the middle, those cautious, the concerned, cautious, disengaged, doubtful, uh, go for the undecided middle. Mainly what they're saying is, is that we're exaggerating the problem. So how do I focus on them? And the idea of destroying the economy, there are two dimensions that 
one is you can't just look at the cost of doing something. You have to also look at the cost of not doing something. And the assessments of the cost of not doing something are starting to get pretty dramatic. And so it's a cost benefit equation that has to look at both sides. They can't simply look at the cost of implementing changes and then going beyond there. Is it really <clears throat> gonna destroy the economy by shifting into the technologies of tomorrow? Um, electric drive trains are the technology of tomorrow. Um, wind and solar geothermal technologies of tomorrow. The idea of propping up a coal industry is really a, an unwise idea if you really wanna think about the economy. And so I think at the root of what these people might also be uncomfortable with is the idea of the government coming in and trying to steer the market. And that's a different debate that really frustrates me, the extent to which many people believe that the government has no role in the market. And the reality is the government sets the market and you give all kinds of examples of the ways in which the government has really pushed technology of innovation. Uh, I just finished a book called The Value of Everything. It's a really nice book talking about this to a large extent. You know, the internet, DARPA. Uh, there are so many ways that the, 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 this myth that, um, you know, Apple was just Stephen Jobs' you know, genius or Tesla is Elon Musk's genius. I mean, the Windows display was invented, invented by a government lab. Apple just took it. Elon Musk did not invent the Tesla automobile. He bought the company. And a lot of the technologies are coming out of government labs, coming out of military R&D. The idea that the government has no role to shift the market is just ignoring reality. And if you really want to bring China and some other countries into the conversation, how can American companies compete against industrial policy in some of these other countries when it's Japan government and industry working together to try and come up with the, the next technologies. So um, I, I've given you a lot there, a big mouthful, but um, yeah, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot in that. And it's a lot in there. That's we great. have a lot of traction, a lot of places to go. This talk was put together and sponsored by um, the Science Rebels, which is a uh, small group within um, Extinction Rebellion, New York City. Uh, our mission is somewhat varied, but essentially, I would say we want to make it really hard, as hard as possible, to ignore what is going on, to ignore the truth of climate change. Um, and we do that in a variety of ways. Um, we had an action last weekend where we brought an outdoor climate museum to the streets. We have climate talks where we invite people to come and talk in a much more controlled environment. And also if you're in XR and you have climate questions where you want to have maybe some research help to get some facts, um, we can also do our best to help with that.